<coughs> Excuse me. Hello and welcome to our program newsroom. I'm your host Sharmeen Ali. Um, today we'll be talking about how President Erdogan is visiting President Donald Trump in the White House. That's uh, an ex uh, a scheduled meeting today between the Turkish president and the American president. Uh, this is amidst all the past. Uh, over the last one month, there have been heightened tensions between the two countries ever since Turkey decided to invade the northern part of Syria. And uh, President Trump then announced that he would be withdrawing the US forces in that region. And uh, he faced a lot of criticism for abandoning his allies who were the Kurds in uh, Syria. So, and Turkey had its own reasons for invading that part of uh, Syria due to the fact that uh, due to the terrorist uh, threats uh, by the PKK in Turkey. Also, uh, Turkey wants a buffer zone in northern uh, Syria in order to repatriate the Syrian refugees which are at the moment in Turkey. So there are a lot of different issues in that whole uh, scenario. And President Trump did face a lot of criticism also by lawmakers in the U.S. 17 lawmakers uh, wrote a, a letter to uh, uh, President Trump to urge him to disinvite President Erdogan, but obviously uh, that uh, did not happen and President Erdogan will be visiting today. So we'll be talking about that on our program today. We'll also be speaking to the vloggers, um, uh, husband and wife, uh, Manisha Malik and Carl Rock. Uh, as uh, we saw on their video logs, uh, how Manisha Malik crossed the Kartarpur border and uh, Kartarpur corridor and came into Pakistan to visit the temple at Kartarpur. Meanwhile, her husband, who is uh, not an Indian, was not allowed to come. So we'll hear about their experience about the Kartarpur corridor. Very emotional video message uh, was given out by the husband and wife, and we'll be speaking to them about that. Um, also, uh, we're going to be talking about some developments in Afghanistan, which are very, very important and key to the region. Uh, Foreign Secretary Sohail Mahmood and Director General uh, Inter-Services Intelligence, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Faiz Hamid, had gone on Monday to visit Kabul and they visited um and met with the Afghan National Security Advisor, Hamdullah Mohib, uh, in order to normalize relations after there had been uh, several areas of contention between the two countries, in um, specifically uh, the two consulates in the two countries. Uh, the consular section of the embassy in Kabul uh, uh, had been shut down by Pakistani officials due to the fact that um, they were, uh, the officials of the consulate were being uh, subject to threats and harassment by people in, in Kabul. And, the Kabul embassy was shut down uh, here in Islamabad due to the fact that uh, in Peshawar uh, there was um police action against the Afghan market due to an ongoing dispute. So, uh, And then also very, very critical in all of this is the fact that uh, uh, prisoner release was announced by President Ashraf Ghani. Three key members of uh, the Taliban will be released by the Afghan government, uh, hopefully in exchange for two professors, one uh, of American origin and one Australian, uh, who were kidnapped uh, about three years ago by the insurgents. And uh, they are uh, professors at the American University in Afghanistan. So some very important developments which might pave the way to uh, further peace talks now between the Afghan government and the Taliban when this prisoner release takes place. So we'll be talking about that as well and with our guests in the studio. Uh, also, um, it's always very important to mention our security forces and the ongoing uh, uh, dangers that they face. Uh, another three soldiers have been martyred from the Pakistan army in North Waziristan. Uh, they are Sipoy Sajid, Sipoy Riyasat, and Sipoy Babar, who have given their lives, against, in, uh, lives again in defense of our country, Pakistan, against terrorist elements. Although uh, the restive region of North Waziristan has uh, greatly been curbed and the terrorist activities there have greatly uh, gone down a lot according to the, the Pakistani uh, sort of military sources, however, small all attacks continue to still take place and Pakistani soldiers continue to give their lives uh, in these regions on a constant basis. Uh, also, uh, we mark the 100th day of uh, complete lockdown in Indian occupied Kashmir. And uh, it has been 100 days since the valley has been under siege by Indian occupation forces. The military uh, has clamped down on the civilians. They are not able to leave their homes. The children are not going to school. Detentions are taking place. People are uh, being arrested arbitrarily. Uh, their raids at night. Children as young as nine years of age are being detained. Women are being raped. Uh, there are killings going on. Uh, and uh, the Indian military forces are getting away with this with complete impunity due to the fact that uh, they have draconian laws in place, such as the 
the Public Safety Act, which allow them to perpetrate such human rights excesses. And ha this has been going on for 72 years, and in the last 30 years alone, uh, it has ex become exceedingly so. And since August 5th, since the abrogation of Article 370 and 35A, there has been a lo complete lockdown in the valley, and still uh, internet communications are not working, and as well as postpaid phones and uh, SMS services. So we'll be talking ab about all these different issues. Um, so now we'll begin. Uh, we're going to talk about now President Erdogan's visit uh, to the U.S., to the White House, and his meeting with President Trump. Uh, let's speak with Mr. Hassan Abdullah, who's a journalist uh, in Turkey. Uh, Mr. Abdullah, uh, thank you for joining us. Hello, Mr. Abdullah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you for having me. Okay, we're trying to get Mr. Hassan Abdullah online uh, from Turkey, who's going to be talking to us about um, uh, how there's a meeting taking place today between President Erdogan and President Trump. Um, this meeting uh, in uh, the in okay now we have online with us again uh, we have uh, Mr. Hassan Abdullah. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Hassan Abdullah from Turkey. Thank you for joining us. Okay, I think we are having uh, some technical issues. Uh, he is going to be online with us shortly. Uh, so. President Erdogan is meeting with President Trump in Washington, D.C. today. Uh, a lot of issues have to be discussed between the two presidents. Uh, as we know, there have been tensions between the two countries, specifically uh, because uh, due to the fact that last month Turkey decided to invade the northern part of Syria. And uh, this is due to Turkey's own concerns about terrorism in their country and also to repatriate um, a large number of refugees that they have from Syria uh, in Turkey back to Syria and to create a buffer zone in the northern region over there. Now, President Trump uh, cooperated initially in this move by withdrawing uh, U.S. forces from that region because Turkey is a key NATO ally of the United States in that area. And um, uh, when he did so and he withdrew his forces from there, he faced a lot of criticism uh, in the U.S. for abandoning their allies, who were the Kurdish forces in Syria who helped them overthrow ISIS and uh, to gain control over that territory. A lot of criticism was uh, faced by President Trump for making that move and after that uh, threats were made to Turkey. President Trump uh, had uh, said that uh, he will obliterate Turkey economically uh, if they continue to uh, with their offensive uh, against northern Syria and the Kurds over there and then eventually a, an agreement was made where uh, the Kurds were allowed to uh, retreat from that region. And now, as we're seeing the two presidents are meeting in Washington, D.C., uh, Mr. Hassan Abdullah, are you online with us right now? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you for joining us. And uh, I'd like to ask you to begin with, in your opinion, um, you're based in Turkey. How uh, significant is this meeting now with uh, President Erdogan and President Trump uh, in light of all the events that have happened in the last month or so and the tensions that increase? Uh, what do you think this meeting, uh, is, what do you think its significance is at the moment? Well, first of all, I think the timing is very significant. From a Turkish point of view, uh, this comes at a time when Turkey has been engaging more with Russians, for example. Uh, recently, one of the contentious issues was the purchase of the S-400 missile defense system. The Americans felt that perhaps uh, the, the NATO ally was moving away from Washington. Uh, that obviously hasn't been the case traditionally in the history of the Turkish Republic. Uh, the Russians felt uh, that perhaps they had an opportunity to try and isolate Turkey from the United States. So uh, Turkish government officials uh, perhaps feel that um, Turkey is in a position to sort of uh, engage in bargaining, especially as some feel that Syria is moving towards the so-called end game. Right. OK. So. Um, all right. So we're just talking about the importance now for this visit at the moment. Um, uh, in your opinion, now, uh, President Trump has had to face a lot of opposition in the United States uh, for this meeting, yet he continued to do so. So what do you think is uh, President Trump's uh, uh, kind of approach to this whole situation? Well, uh, as a businessman, I think President Trump uh, does uh, put the economics of the matter at the very center of the affair. He understands very pragmatically that uh, the two countries are talking about taking bilateral trade volume to about $100 billion. 
Um, you know, this is very important for the United States, considering the current economic situation, especially if you look at the unemployment rate and so forth. Uh, obviously, it benefits Turkey as well. So there is a bit of a win-win situation that the two are trying to create. From President Trump's perspective, he's obviously moving into the elections next year. So this is a good time for him to show his people that uh, he's taken steps that have perhaps economically benefited them. Right, absolutely. Now, uh, Turkey is also responsible for the uh, ISIS fighters that are captured in that region. And um, um, that is one main uh, element about what's going to be the fate of those ISIS uh, fighters. So wh what are your comments on that? Well, Turkey at the moment is holding about 1,200 uh, ISIS suspects. And um, one of the contentious issues here in Ankara at the moment, and the Turkish side has been talking to European partners in particular, is the fact that many European countries have uh, stripped citizenships of uh, their people uh, who they accused of being members of ISIS. They're refusing to take them back. And Turkey is saying that there's a limit to how many uh, people it can keep here, uh, of course, in the form of these ISIS suspects. And uh, this is one of the things we understand President Erdogan is going to be discussing with President Trump, that he needs to also um, pressurize his European partners and tell them that they need to uh, play a role in basically uh, rehabilitation of uh, these ISIS suspects and at least taking them back and dealing with them. So that's one of the issues. But I think the very core issue that the two are going to be talking about is the U.S. policy on supporting the YPG, which Turkey says is clearly the Syrian branch of the PKK terrorist organization, uh, which Americans recognize as a terrorist organization. The European Union recognizes them as a terrorist organization. And uh, the Turkish officials were quite upset at the fact that President Trump had tweeted uh, inviting uh, someone going by the name General Mazlum Abdi. His name is Farhat Abdi Shaheen. He's the adopted son of uh, jailed PKK leader Abdullah Ocalan, and uh, he has been a core member of PKK core committee. So the Turkish side is saying that you cannot you know, legitimize an actor who's part of a terrorist organization, and that's not going to augur well uh, when it comes to relations between two NATO allies. Right, absolutely. So a lot of different issues that need to be ironed out there. Thank you so much, Mr. Hassan Abdullah, for joining us. Um, now we'll be speaking about uh, the couple who are uh, video loggers, uh, Manisha Malik and Carl Rock. We will uh, be talking to them about their experience about the Kartarpur corridor opening. Um, Manisha Malik is uh, Indian in origin, and she uh, was allowed to cross over uh, from the Kartarpur corridor into Pakistan and to see the opening of the temple, whereas her husband was not because he's uh, not an Indian national so let's hear about their experiences uh, uh, Manisha Malik and Karl Rock uh, are you with me um, online okay we're just gonna show a video first this is not a joke I'm not kidding have you told your parents that I'm doing this that you're going okay so tell us how are we getting there Manu so we are going to use the Kartarpur corridor that Pakistan has recently opened for the Indian pilgrims and when I say we I mean us because Carl ain't going nowhere this is not fair so foreigners aren't allowed to use the Kartarpur corridor so that's why I'm sending you basically Nah. So, Cello, take well, us well, to Pakistan, nah? Let's go. I'm not allowed to go any further. No, you're not. All right. Bye. See you, Manu. Have fun. Bye. And don't say namaste like I did at the border. No. Say assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Bye. 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 See you. Have fun. So we're now going to go through the terminal building. That's huge. Got a real good piece of it. These are the entry gates. So the security check has been done and now we're heading towards the immigration so I might have to turn off my camera again. See you in a while. So the security check is done, the immigration is done and I was actually given polio drops here which I hadn't expected at all. I am very excited and also a little emotional at the same time. I have to go a little bit further but I have butterflies in my stomach right now. <laughs> okay, so Manu has gone now. First, she's going to go through Indian immigration, which is in this massive building behind it. All kind of blocked off so you can't see it. Then a bus is going to take you to the zero point, to the border. Uh, hello, now we have online with us Carl Rock. Carl, thank you for joining us online. 
No problem. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, Carl, now we were just watching your video log about your experience uh, about your wife crossing over uh, uh, from the Kartarpur corridor to visit the temple in Pakistan, and uh, you were not able to come. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, foreigners aren't allowed to use the Kartarpur corridor. It's only for Indians. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. And uh, so she crossed the border and she came. You waited on the other side for approximately six hours or so, I believe. Yeah, I was waiting for her, but there's, there are things for me to do there. So you can actually see across the border into Pakistan, and you can go and visit the border fence, and you can actually see the Qatar for Sahib from the India border. They've got a viewpoint for pilgrims who can't go. Right, right. Okay. So uh, once your wife uh, went into uh, Pakistan to visit the temple at Kartarpur, what, were her, what was her feedback when she came back? How did she feel about it? I'm not sure, is she of uh, the Sikh faith or, or, or not? And how was her feelings about, how were her feelings? Did she just go as a tourist to see what this was like? And tell us a bit about her experience. Yes, she's a Hindu. And she was a bit nervous before going because she didn't know what to expect. But this is the great thing about the Kartarpur Corridor, this initiative. It's bringing Indians and Pakistanis closer together. And she came back with a big smile on her face, and she absolutely had a lovely time in Pakistan. And she said everybody was so welcoming to her. The hospitality was amazing. And she also said that she found Pakistan even cleaner than India in terms of less rubbish on the ground and less stray animals on the ground. So, had an amazing time and it really changed her perspective being able to visit Pakistan. Right, and what was her impression of the temple itself uh, as a homage to Baba Guru Nanak and uh, for interfaith harmony and showing uh, the, the sort of cooperation between different faiths and uh, the intermingling and enmeshing of different faiths in one place. What was her, her impression about that? It was absolutely incredible. So the, the Sahib, the Gurudwara, is in pristine condition. It is so white. And Pakistan has so, done so much work inside that Gurudwara. They've built a sarovar, this beautiful pool. There's a museum. There's, it's, it's just an incredible structure. And, yeah, she got to meet a lot of Pakistani people there at the Gurudwara as well. It's a fantastic place for Indians and, and Pakistanis to meet. And... I know from my video, a lot of Indians are now planning to come to um, Pakistan. Right. Okay. So, and uh, do you feel that this is a big step towards more religious inclusivity? And do you feel that more uh, religious tourism in Pakistan would be appreciated by people on the Indian side? Because you have a lot of Hindu temples here as well, in excess of 500 of them. So, do you feel that your wife and others like her would like to be able to visit those? Definitely. Indians want to come to Pakistan and they want to go on religious tours there. So there's also another very, very important Gurudwara in Pakistan where Guru Nanak Dev Ji was born. So Indians can't go to that yet. But yeah, right. the Kartarpur corridor is such an amazing first step at connecting Indians and, and Pakistanis together, you know. Right, okay, that I think you're talking about the temple uh, of Nankana Sahib, and uh, over there, uh, that is the birthplace of Baba Guru Nanak Ji, and uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan has announced the opening of a, a university there, uh, uh, Baba Guru Nanak University over there, so that will encourage uh, Sikh students as well as students of all faith to come and study in one place, and uh, in, historically, uh, a lot of different uh, uh, faiths would study at the religious uh, locations and especially the big shrines of the saints and all where they had madrasas and schools you'd have people of all faiths over there so that had a lot of religious uh, inclusivity right there as well would you think that that's a, a good idea that's an amazing idea places like gurudwaras they are open to everybody so even muslims should be coming to qatar Sahib and enjoying the hospitality from their sikh brothers as well Right. And do you think that um, uh, such a move where uh, Pakistan and India cooperated, uh, you're a foreigner living in India and uh, you must be feeling the recent tensions between the two countries. And naturally, it's bothersome for everybody in the, in the two countries, especially the common citizens. So um, being from uh, living in India, do you think that uh, the cooperation you saw with the Kartarpur opening, do you think 
that do you wish that that will uh, encourage further cooperation between the two countries and do you think there are avenues there I'm, I'm not too sure about that. That's kind of a political question. But in the minds of the common man in India, I think this Karatapur corridor is going to bring people together because Indians can actually walk across to Pakistan and meet Pakistanis. You know, that was the whole goal of my video, to bring Indians and Pakistanis closer together. I don't know if politically it'll, it'll change anything, you know, but the common man in India and the common man in Pakistan, th there's no hate there. You know, we're all brothers and we're all from the same place, you know. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Carl Rock, for joining us online. Um, so we were talking uh, to Carl Rock, who is a video logger, and uh, he made uh, some videos that we showed you earlier. Him and his wife uh, made a video of the Kartarpur uh, corridor opening, and uh, she had an opportunity to visit Kartarpur temple and cross uh, by the corridor into Pakistan. And she visited the temple, and uh, per her husband, she's had a very good experience here, and she uh, found the people to be very hospitable and she was very impressed by the cleanliness of the country over here and the temple and uh, we'll, we hope uh, to be getting her online as well so we can get her views on her uh, visit and her experience so uh, the Kartarpur uh, corridor opening naturally was um, uh, the first time in 72 years that members of the Sikh community and uh, pilgrims uh, of the Sikh faith could come uh, and cross over straight across the border without any visa and uh, access the temple that is very dear to them which is known as their Medina like uh, in the Muslim faith uh, they're the two religious sites of Makkah and Medina so for them that's uh, Nankana Sahib and Kartarpur Sahib uh, are their two religious uh, sites so now we have online with us um, uh, uh, we have Manisha online with us actually Manisha Malik who was a video logger who came into Pakistan whose husband we were just speaking to Manisha thank you so much for joining us online today Thank you. Thank you so much for having us on the show. Uh, so Manisha, we all saw your video uh, and uh, it seems that you crossed over from uh, India into Pakistan by the Kartarpur corridor. Did you make this trip as a tourist or as a journalist or what, what was your role in all of this? Because um, it, it was it's an opening for Sikh pilgrims primarily to come and visit one of their holiest shrines. What was your interest in coming to visit? Well, I just was happy that I got the opportunity um, to visit right. Pakistan, and I was very excited, not just not as a journalist or blogger, just uh, as an Indian or as a person. And it was one of the most memorable experiences to visit Pakistan, and I really want to go back and visit other areas as well. Right. And do you feel that such people-to-people uh, -people interaction that you've had in your recent visit, um, how do you feel that they impact the impressions uh, that we have of each other, uh, people across the border, Indians and Pakistanis? Because you hear the national narratives and you hear the political narratives, yet the people-to-people -people interaction is often very different. Uh, yes, I do feel there should be more of such people-to-people -people interactions, and it would it would definitely help break stereotypes. And um, yeah, the people are just so warm on both sides of borders. Of course, there's crazies, as we mentioned, on both sides as well. But I'm so happy that the majority of people are actually just normal people like us. Right, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your experience that you had uh, when you crossed over uh, from India. Tell us, uh, take us through that journey of yours. What was that like? What were you feeling and what were you seeing? Well, as I mentioned, I was really excited and um, the warmth and the positivity with which people received us uh, was, was I, I can't describe it in words. It was very emotional for me. And it was more than actually what I had expected. I had expected nice people, but I hadn't expected, um, you know, hospitality of this level. Right. It was really nice. It was a wonderful experience, and I'm going to cherish this experience throughout, throughout my life. Right, absolutely. And I can say likewise, when I visited India f a couple of years ago, I had a very similar, very positive experience. Now, um, what I'd like to ask you, being somebody from the Hindu faith, Pakistan has about 400 uh, very uh, ancient Hindu temples here. Would a person like yourself or people who you know in your community, would they uh, be interested in wanting to see these uh, Hindu temples and uh, do pilgrimages there like the Sikhs are over here with their, where, with their temples? Um, yeah, well, I'm not a practicing Hindu, 
but i would definitely want to visit you know places of all religion because i believe there's something to learn from every religion i don't see any religion above the other and um, i'm a big fan of you know all the religions Thank you so much for joining us online, Manisha Malik. Uh, and uh, after the break, we're going to be coming back and talking about uh, the developments in Afghanistan and the recent talks between the Pakistan Foreign Secretary and the DGISI with the National Security Advisor in Afghanistan. Please stay with us and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Uh, in this segment, uh, we'll be discussing the uh, recent talks that have taken place between uh, Foreign Secretary Sohail Mahmood and Director General Inter-Services Intelligence uh, General Faiz. Uh, with the Afghan uh, National Security Advisor, they have been in Kabul on Monday and uh, today, uh, very recently, yesterday, actually, President Ashraf Ghani announced that he'll be releasing um, uh, some Taliban prisoners, three key prisoners in exchange for two professors of the American University uh, in in um, Kabul, uh, in Afghanistan. Now, this is a very significant development, and especially uh, following their visit to Afghanistan. Also, the talks included the recent hostilities where the embassies and the consulates had been shut down in both, uh, on both sides of the border due to Pakistani officials facing harassment uh, in uh, Kabul, and the Afghan uh, embassy consulate closing down due to the fact that uh, the dispute of the uh, Afghan market in Peshawar and the police raiding that area. So uh, let's uh, introduce our guest on our program who's going to be talking to us about this. Uh, this is uh, Brigadier Tipu Sultan who's with us, who's a senior analyst and uh, very often on our program uh, to give us his insights. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us. Uh, sir, now... Um, the talks that are going to be uh, taking uh, that have been taking place uh, day before yesterday on Monday between the Foreign Secretary DGISI and the National Security Advisor in Afghanistan, uh, a couple of different dis disputes that were discussed. One was the cross-border firing that were, was happening at uh, the place where the border posts were still being uh, built. The other was uh, the harassment of embassy officials. And um, these are the main things, um, and they, they've agreed to form a committee to resolve these disputes. Do you feel that this is now a very positive measure in order to go forward with the recent sort of escalation of tensions between the two countries? Sure, I mean, uh, one would have thought that uh, the Afghan peace process will bear some results, and we've had uh, number of rounds of talks in Doha and elsewhere in Pakistan, in Moscow and Beijing regarding the prospects of peace in Afghanistan. But it got sort of uh, kept getting delayed and one factor was the foreign elections, the fourth of foreign election which took uh, quite a few weeks back and the result is still not announced and uh, the turnout has been very less of 18, 19 or 20 percent out of 9.6 uh, million only about 35 million uh, people voted in there. Uh, so the government in Kabul uh, is, is not uh, of the nature that uh, it can steer uh, Afghanistan out of trouble or any other country to negotiate with. In the background, backdrop of that, there are certain un unwanted incidents which took place, which you mentioned, which is the cross-border firing in which Pakistani soldiers suffered. Pakistan has exercised quite a bit of restraint with Afghanistan, I can assure you that. The capabilities of uh, both the nations are very different and Pakistan has exercised restraint, uh, commendable restraints against uh, such actions by the Afghan forces and the harassment of um, the diplomats and, uh, and then the capture of certain professors and other civilians. Um, there, are, there are other abductions mm -hmm. uh, of Pakistani origin from Kabul and Kandahar that we know of. So in the background of that, of, of that the visit of the, the ISI chief and the foreign secretary, I think it, it, it's very important. Mm -hmm. 
they they have they have gone into talks with the afghan uh, national security advisor hamdullah mohib uh, i think uh, the institutional connection uh, other than the political connection is more important right now with afghanistan because in afghanistan the government we, we don't know what sort of a government is going to come up and what is going to be the result of the afghan elections given the acrimony between abdullah abdullah and ashraf ghani and all that in the previous elections the same thing took place but the americans you know came for the rescue and you know so what came. what are the chances that uh, the taliban are going to be is this going to be an inclusive government with the taliban being part of a sort of a democratic system because we've seen oh, gulbuddin uh, hikmatyar uh, who was previously uh, a warlord uh, he's been uh, integrated uh, into the political system do you think other taliban members will also be doing that uh, in the future you asked a very pertinent question uh, taliban do not recognize the elections they have said in so many terms uh, and it stems out from the fact that parties to the conflict uh, or the stakeholders wanted them to negotiate with the with the government in Kabul, which the Taliban have been refusing. And they said that they don't do not recognize it. It is a puppet sponsored government. Right. Um, Taliban style of government does not believe in the democratic system as it exists. And in any case, the democratic system in Afghanistan is not delivered. It has been fourth election and far from being clear whether the elections were legitimate or not mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. So uh, I think the, the, the Taliban has been saying and they have been demanding from the Americans that they should, they should announce a withdrawal or exit schedule from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And the Americans have been saying, no, you should ask, you should first decide the ceasefire and other conditionalities, etc. And the, the, the talks have been in lurch and limbo. The other uh, uh, spoilers like India did, does not want uh, the change of situation in Afghanistan and peace to come because it will be much to the benefit of Pakistan. Of course, it will be much to the benefit of Afghanistan either. Mm -hmm. But the Afghans, Afghans have to uh, understand what is in, the, in their best interest and they have to solve their own problems. So, right now, I have to say that Afghanistan is in a mess. It is, it is not better than what it was yesterday and we do not, what is going to ha we do not know what is going to happen tomorrow. Right. So in that, I think the, this visit was very essential because the, the people to people con contact is not there. The, 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 the heads of the state and the government's contact is meaningless because the Afghan government in Kabul is, is not very stable. So the ISI and the secretary went over there to negotiate with their, uh, perhaps um, the national security advisor, and maybe part of the NSD over there. And uh, I think Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, leaving aside whether there is going to be a peace negotiation, final, final outcome of the peace negotiation of the Taliban, Americans, and Afghans in an intra-Afghan dialogue, etc. But these little incidences which happens. Uh, between the two countries have to be avoided. They have to be avoided right now. The development of how our, uh, President Ashraf Ghani has announced the release of hostages. Um, uh, now, uh, the prisoners that are going to be released by the Afghan side are the three Taliban prisoners. One is Anas Haqqani, who is... Um, whose older brother is the deputy Taliban leader and head of the Haqqani network. Yeah. So, uh, you know, very big uh, Taliban affiliate. And then there's also um, two others, who, one is Haji uh, Mali Khan, who is believed to be the uncle of the Haqqani network leader, uh, Sirajuddin Haqqani. And then there's also Abdul Rashid, who's supposed to be the brother of Muhammad Nabi Umar, uh, a member of the Taliban's political office in Qatar. Now, these are very high profile uh, prisoners that are being released by uh, uh, the Afghan government. And in return, the prisoners uh, who the Taliban have in their custody, there are two American, um, sorry, uh, one American and one Australian. Uh, American is Kevin King and the Australian is Timothy Weeks. Uh, these were professors from the American University in Afghanistan. They've been captive for three years. And uh, one of them, um, I think it's the, the American gentleman, Kevin King, who he's, uh, the Taliban are concerned about his health. They're saying he's very weak and they were afraid that he would actually, you know, he could die. So naturally the families are very concerned and they might be released. So this is a huge development, wouldn't you say? Well, so? yeah, this is a huge development and previously, 
Um, uh, you know for a fact that Mullah brother was uh, released, who was the, one of the chief negotiators yeah. between the Taliban and, and, and the Americans. Um, I think the release of uh, these very important uh, Haqqani um, faction of uh, the Taliban leaders is very significant. Uh, I, my personal view is that uh, uh, Ashraf Ghani is not that strong as it, he used to be. He was not very strong in the presence of Abdullah, Abdullah all right. But he has weakened even after the elections. And uh, he, he, he has released um, uh, these Afghan leaders and that should tell us that uh, it, it is going to augur well for the future talks between the um, Taliban and the overall intra-Afghan dialogue that we have been looking at. Remember, the key thing is that how the Afghans come together to solve their own problems. Exactly. So Whether, this, whether mm -hmm. what sort of a government do we expect in Kabul after the American withdrawal and as a result of uh, the peace talks. Mm -hmm. That is very important. That will tell you uh, whether we will be able to avoid uh, the fighting or not. Right. And so this development with the prisoner release and the exchange of hostages, you think this will, uh, President Ashraf Ghani said this might pave the way for, towards unofficial talks between the Taliban and the Afghan government. So do you think this is a, this a is, step in the right direction? Very, this is very significant. Mm. I, 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 the, the Pashtun way of politicking is that they, they, they would like to you know negotiate from the position of strength, especially the Taliban. Mm -hmm. And the government, of, uh, government in Kabul was not giving them space. And after having realized in a prolonged way that the Taliban still control a uh, significant uh, area in Afghanistan and they are very powerful and mm -hmm. without uh, you know, the American support, the Afghan government cannot last for long, uh, I think uh, the negotiations uh, may, may bear results in future. Right. Yeah. So, um, sir, now uh, naturally the Afghans would like a pluralistic democracy, which includes everybody. It's inclusive of all the ethnic groups and uh, all the different uh, civil society members, women, everybody concerned. And their concerns are that uh, the Taliban, after the peace agreement with the United States, might just bring about an Islamic emirate uh, like uh, they had done previously. So uh, what is, in your opinion, do you oh, expect well, to come uh, From 96 to 2000, the, the, the style in which the Taliban ruled uh, may not be applicable in 2000. 20 onwards. And um, Zabiullah Mujahid is known to have said the Taliban are not uh, looking to rule Afghanistan all by themselves. But having said that, I think within the fri framework of tribalism in Afghanistan, within the framework of various factions and ethnicities in Afghanistan, like Dari speaking or Tajiks or Uzbeks or Hazaras, there has to be some adju adjustment short of uh, a real democratic vote itself. Right. And the tribal adjustment will tell you that uh, the, Af the in, Af in, in Afghanistan, in any tribal adjustment, the, ta the Taliban are, are likely to come up the strongest. It is up to them how much do they want uh, to accommodate the others. Mm -hmm. they, do they want to steamroll the others or do they want to accommodate the others? I think, I think uh, the Taliban in, uh, have internally decided that they, they will share power with other groups in Afghanistan if Afghanistan has to stay as one country. Exactly. And the, the war that's been taking place in Afghanistan over the past 18 years, the main toll has been on civilians that we've talked about over and over. And 20, 2019, per some Afghan uh, sources, has been the bloodiest year for Afghanistan. And out of those, uh, just yesterday, an attack, or today actually, it was 37 uh, were killed. Uh, civilians were killed and the majority are children. Well, Afghanistan is a land uh, since Halaku Khan and since the British time and since Habibullah uh, and all and since the kingships and then the Kamenists and then the Taliban. You can never watch what is going to happen tomorrow. Uh, I hope and wish that they, the, the fighting stops and peace comes to Afghanistan. But uh, it is easier said than done. Um, it is not uh, very immediate. I cannot see it on the horizon that everything is going to be hunky and dory. Though Pakistan would want it is a prolonged war. We want to want peace. We want uh, our forces to be released from the Afghan-Pakistan border. We want good relations. We want good uh, trade, etc. And uh, these small little dis um, incidences of uh, violence 
across the Doran line and in Kabul or in Islamabad, should I say, um, they do not uh, contribute well for the peace. Absolutely. Yeah. So definitely it's in Pakistan's best interest and the Absolutely. region's interest mm -hmm. to resolve yeah. this uh, dispute going on there and hopefully there will be a resolution Indeed. soon. Thank you so much, Brigadier Thank Tipu Sultan, yeah. for joining us again. Um, uh, today also marks the 100 days of the crippling lockdown in Indian-occupied Kashmir. Uh, it's been 100 days since the people in the valley have uh, been devoid of internet service and SMS services. Um, they've also uh, not been able to come out of their homes.